My friends, welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be describing how concrete structures are designed in Australia. So I'll just be giving a quick overview of the design steps that you would expect. And when I say design, I mean structural design aspect. Now in Australia, the design of concrete buildings or even concrete infrastructure is controlled by a set of standards. And these standards uh, specify guidelines for designers to follow. Uh, the necessary standard that you would have a look at if you're designing a concrete structure in Australia is AS3600. Now, we all know that concrete is strong in compression, but it's weak in tension. So if I've got, imagine I have an element in my hand and if I bend it upwards, the bottom end of that element would experience tension, whereas the top bit of that object is going to be experiencing compression. And you can see that in the image in front of you over here. So to compensate for that weakness in tension, we add steel reinforcement. The types of load are important when designing a concrete structure. There are two main types of loads. There's your point load. And this point load is, for instance, you can think of it as load that is due to a column, a column that exerts a load on, say, a slab. Uh, you can also have distributed load. And an example of a distributed load would be, for instance, if you're designing a concrete water tank, the water inside the tank uh, would exert a pressure on the base of the, of the tank, and that uh, would be considered as distributed loads. Now, once you have uh, categorized your loads into point loads and distributed loads, the next step when you're designing a structure is to understand how the load pattern is. So you're looking at the load path. As an example, you can see that in, on the screen in front of you. Uh, on the left hand side, if you have a building, there's a load that's exerted on the slabs. Now this load is then transferred to the beams and the beams, they transfer the load to the column and then the column transfer the load to the foundation. And then the foundation transfers or dissipates that load into the soil. So this is the common sort of loading pattern you, you would expect from a typical concrete structure. In terms of the load as well, we need to understand the demand. Now, there's a separate standard for that, and it is AS1170. It gives us uh, a guideline on the various load conditions. So it tells you sort of how to factor in dead loads, live loads, and wind loads. A dead load is a load that is fixed in position. For instance, the self-weight of a beam, of a concrete beam, would be considered as a dead load. On the other hand, a live load would be considered, for instance, people that are moving uh, on a typical concrete slab. Designers usually adopt this concept of limit state design. Now, limit state design uh, tries to test the limits of your structure. So how long the structure can go before it becomes uh, structurally inadequate. There's two concepts associated with limit state that designers adopt, the ultimate limit state and the serviceability limit state. What's the difference between these two? Well, in ultimate limit state, the designer would be designing the structure to ensure its safety by trying to fulfill the strength demand. And a designer would do that by looking at two main uh, measures, the moment and the shear. So the moment you design uh, for the moment to ensure a sufficient moment, uh, and a moment can be described if I have an object and I try to twist or try to bend, sorry, the object, then that bending uh, force is what you, what you would label as moment. Uh, shear, on the other hand, is if I have my two palms uh, close to one another, if I move one above and one below the other, this sort of friction that's taking place is what you would describe as the shear forces. Now these two forces are, ex are experienced by your concrete um, elements and it's necessary to design such that you ensure that the capacity uh, of these uh, concrete elements are not exceeded when it comes to moment and shear. When you talk about serviceability limit state, uh, the designer over here is concerned with how the structure is designed so that it ensures its uh, comfortable use. Um, so the, the designer would be looking at deflection and cracks. Now as an example, uh, to demonstrate how this structural design aspect works, uh, we'll be having a look at the design of a concrete beam. Now, when you want to design a concrete beam, you have to consider the flexural capacity of the beam. Uh, 
And a flexural capacity is defined as the ability of the beam to resist failure in bending, and that's when you know you bend your objects, like I demonstrated previously. Shear capacity, again, another thing that you have to design, uh, to, that you have to consider in design, and that's where the force in the beam acting perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, and that's the demonstration that I did with the palms of my hand, and then you have to consider deflection and finally crack control. Now these are all specified in AS3600. So when you design a beam, you have to look at your concrete mix. And your concrete, when I say concrete mix, I mean the interaction uh, between the concrete that's produced, so the cement type that you have in your concrete mix, the aggregates, and the steel that will be embedded in your concrete members. Uh, so some of the questions that a designer would be asking is what's the minimum moment capacity required by the, the, the concrete section or the member? And what is the minimum shear capacity that's required by the section and member? So these are two important parameters to design for. Now the first step in the uh, design process is having a look at exposure conditions. So you have to look at where the structure is actually located. Uh, now, you refer to AS3600 in table 4.3. It gives you the locations in accordance with the map that you see in front of you. Um, and then, depending on that location, you would then get the results of the minimum cover that would be required for your concrete element from table 4.10.3.2 in AS3600, as well as the minimum compressive strength of your uh, concrete section. The minimum cover is, as I said, specified in table 4.10.3.2 in AS3600. And you can see in the diagram on the left-hand side what the cover refers to. It's that distance between the surface of your steel that's embedded inside the concrete member and the surface of the concrete. And then the second step is you'd have to estimate the self-weight of your concrete beam. Now to do that, Designers usually adopt rules of thumb. So an example of a rule of thumb is to get the depth, which is capital D. Uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it's the length L of the, of the beam divided by 10. So that's roughly sort of the depth that they start off with. And then you have to estimate the width as well. So a sufficient width could be obtained through that rule of thumb that you see, 0.6 multiplied by the depth. Uh, of the beam that you got from the uh, previous calculation up to 0.8 as well of the depth. Third step now when you have estimated your uh, the dimensions of your section is to look at the load combinations. Now the load combinations is where you consider your dead loads, your live loads, any wind loads as well that are involved and these are usually then factored for safety. So you can see that the uh, dead load over here which is capital G is multiplied in one instance of a load combination by 1.35 as specified by the standards. Um, in another instance of a load combination you can have both capital G and capital Q. Ca capital Q over here stands for your live load so it's 1.2 uh, multiplied by the dead load plus 1.5 multiplied by the live load. So this is the load combination that a designer would be uh, designing the structure based on. Um, and then this calculation, so this load combination that you obtain can be used to calculate your maximum moment uh, of the beam to design. Number four, so step number four is where you um, use a software and that's what usually structural uh, designers would, would use, uh, a software that would analyze the structure for them. So it would give them the maximum moment and the shear. And on the right hand side, you can see an example of a slab that's uh, being uh, examined in, a, in, in one of the common softwares adopted in the uh, industry. Step number five is where now you have your structural design that needs to take place. So the designer needs to, to check the estimated dimensioning that had taken place in an earlier step. So you look at the dimensions of the beam, are they adequate or not? And then you find what the area of the reinforcement that's required to sustain the tensile uh, forces on your uh, concrete member. Finally, when it comes to shear, you'd have to consider what quantity of stirrups uh, would be required in order to resist the shear forces. In step number six, the designer would look at the deflection and make sure that it's within the limits specified in the Australian standards. Now when it comes to deflection, there's short-term deflection and then there's long-term deflection. 
and the deflection is what you see in, in front of you on the image over here. So it's that distance between the original state of the beam versus when it's loaded and it's bent like you can see. And then in step number seven, uh, the designer considers how to control cracks, specifically uh, include reinforcement in the, um, in the concrete section to ensure that your tensile region is adequately uh, reinforced. So um, the specification for crack control is usually through uh, mentioning a minimum amount of reinforcement that would be required in these tensile regions. And the limits uh, in terms of the distancing between these reinforcement is specified again in the Australian standards. Now the final step, and this is a very important step, is when it comes to detailing. It's a step that um, sometimes there's, uh, there's a lot of errors that are associated with this step, particularly on a construction site when people are laying down uh, the steel reinforcement in the concrete members. It's, uh, this detailing uh, step involves linking the various uh, reinforcement in different sections together. And it's important to make sure it's done correctly. Uh, if it's appropriately connected to other members, the steel reinforcement, so for instance, let's say the column and the beam, as you can see on the screen in front of you, uh, it's a way of improving the ductility of your structure. So you make sure that uh, the structure can withstand uh, stresses exerted on it for a long period of time.